Hello and welcome to Unit 1 of the International Corporate Law and Governance module. In Unit 1A, so the first chunk of this unit, um, I'm going to be looking at how the UK company law has developed. So we'll be doing a bit of history, which uh, is one of my favourite subjects, so I'll try not to bore you too much with it. Um, but it's important to understand how UK company law developed uh, in order to understand where we are now with it. Because, in fact, not a lot has really changed since the uh, first companies were incorporated uh, by statute in the mid-19th century. It's also important globally because a good understanding of UK company law means that you should have a good understanding of company law in whichever jurisdiction you happen to be working in or living in. Because there was a lot of common ground with corporate law. So, let's take a look then at the learning outcomes. So there are just two for this uh, particular unit. So we'll look at, as I said, how UK uh, limited companies developed and we're going to be looking at one of the key concepts of company law which is separate legal personality. The company has actually been around for a very long time. The first companies uh, were incorporated in the UK by Royal Charter so if someone wanted to form a company uh, they would have to apply to the Crown and the Crown would then uh, after very often a long delay, grant what's called a royal charter and the company would come into existence. So this way of incorporating companies goes right back to the, the 14th and the 15th centuries. Uh, and this is how organisations like Oxford and Cambridge universities became, uh, became incorporated. In commercial terms, the, the Royal Charter companies that are of most interest and are most uh, closely aligned with uh, companies as we know them today were the trading companies. The, the 16th and the 17th centuries in particular were a time of great expansion of uh, British trade. The, the British Empire was uh, developing in those centuries and one of the peculiarities of the, 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 the British Empire is that it was an empire largely based on trade and exploiting raw materials and uh, other resources in uh, other parts of the world. And the way that this happened was not so much by the government but by private companies. So we see lots of uh, large trading companies being incorporated by Royal Charter, the East India Company, the West India Company, uh, and one that we'll say some more about in a moment, the South Sea Company. And these companies would then take their Royal Charters uh, and they would go off and uh, seek their fortunes in different parts of the world. So that's really where we can identify the, the, the first trading companies, the first uh, use of the company as a business structure, a purely business structure. Initially these companies were uh, private, the shares in those companies uh, were owned by groups of, of friends and acquaintances, business partners, but particularly during the, the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the shares in these companies started to be publicly traded. So this was the first example of what we now know as uh, shares quoted on a stock exchange. So nowadays we have the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, um, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Tokyo Stock Exchange. Back in the, the late, 16th, late, late 17th and uh, early 18th centuries, a market started to develop in London for shares in these Royal Charter companies. And lots of people, as today, saw this as uh, a good way of getting rich quickly. Which brings us to the, uh, what's become known as the South Sea Bubble of 1720. I'll provide you a link there to a, uh, a YouTube video which 
goes into the, uh, the South Sea bubble story in much more depth than I'm going to do. But essentially what happened was that a royal charter uh, was granted for a company called the South Sea Company. And as with the other trading companies, uh, this company was given a monopoly to develop uh, trading opportunities in uh, that particular part of the world, in the, in the South Seas. The company was enormously successful. So there were lots of uh, rumours, lots of stories doing the rounds in London society about just how uh, rich, just how valuable the trading opportunities were for this company. And so shares in the South Sea Company became the, the, the kind of must-have accessory for uh, everybody in London society. And lots and lots of people invested their, their money in these shares. Lots of the people investing were members of the, the aristocracy, the gentry, also many members of parliament. So the price of these shares rocketed. Unfortunately, the trading opportunities that were expected proved to be uh, much proved to be uh, much less than had been anticipated. So the actual profitability of the company was extremely dubious, and stories uh, started to do the rounds about the the fact that this company actually had no real substance; that it was a bubble. And so the price of the shares, having skyrocketed, plummeted. And uh, lots of very wealthy and influential people lost an enormous amount of money, including MPs, including cabinet ministers indeed. The, the most important result of the, uh, the, the South Sea bubble and the crash of the South Sea company was that many influential people who had lost money decided that they wanted to restrict opportunities for investing in companies in the future. So what the government did was they, they effectively banned the creation of, uh, of trading companies. They banned the creation of, uh, in particular, the, the sale of shares to members of the public. So, for around a century, the, the main form of business structure was not the, the limited company, but instead it was the, the partnership. However, business people are very creative and they will always try and find a way around the, uh, the law, around regulation. And that's a problem that we'll identify uh, in more recent times as well. But what happened was that uh, business people who wanted the, the advantages of uh, a limited company, and in particular the fact that the company was a separate legal personality, as we'll see shortly, what they started doing was setting up trusts. Now, trusts are a, another type of legal structure whereby uh, individuals or indeed other organisations called trustees will hold property, will own the legal title to property on behalf of others. And so business people started setting up these settlements, settlement companies, uh, to enable others to invest in those businesses. So they weren't using a company structure, so they were getting around the law, but they were using the device of the trust to do this. So they were still now able to invite members of the public to invest in their businesses, but they were doing it through a trust rather than a company. By the early 19th century, these uh, settlement companies were really becoming um, very important. And the UK government bowed to the inevitable. They decided that they weren't going to be able to ban um, companies from selling shares to members of the public. Therefore, they should try and regulate it. 
They should try and regulate this activity. So this led to the passing through Parliament of the first uh, real piece of company legislation, the Joint Stock Companies Act 1844. And this piece of legislation is important because for the first time it created a way of registering a company, registering a limited company. So instead of having to uh, petition the Crown to get a royal charter or the other way of incorporating a company up to this time was to take a, a, a private bill through the Houses of Parliament, again that would be extremely uh, difficult, expensive and time consuming. So what the Joint Stock Companies Act 1844 did was it created a relatively simple, straightforward way of incorporating a company simply by essentially filling in a few forms and filing them at a central register called Companies House. This was then followed in 1855 by the Limited Liability Act which created uh, the concept of limited liability. So the 1844 Act created the uh, possibility to register a company as a separate legal entity. The Limited Liability Act in 1855 enabled people to benefit from the concept of limited liability. In other words, if you form a company, you are no longer personally liable for the debts um, of that business. These two acts were then uh, combined in the Joint Stock Companies Act 1856. Shortly afterwards, there was a, a key case, really the most important case in uh, the whole area of corporate law, and that's the case of Salomon and Salomon, which is often regarded as the, uh, the, the basis, really, of company law in the UK, and indeed worldwide because it set out the basic principles of uh, separate legal, legal personality and it put an interpretation on the company's acts which has remained largely unchallenged until today. And I'm going to say some more about Salomon & Salomon in a moment because it is such a key case and it's an important one to understand. So after the Joint Stock Companies Act 1856, there were a range of new Companies Acts passed through the UK Parliament. Um, most significant ones were probably the Companies Act of 1948, uh, which really consolidated all the previous legislation and remained in force largely unaltered until the 1980s. Um, there was a Companies Act in 1985, which again was a uh, consolidating act, particularly introduced um, because there had been some amendments to UK company law as a result of the UK joining the European Community in, in 1973. Um, but the big uh, modification, the big revision of UK company law happened in the Companies Act 2006 and that is the, the most current piece of legislation and the one that we'll be referring to as we go forward through this module. So what is the concept of corporate personality? I've, I've spoken about it a few times now. Well, essentially, um, when a company is registered, so if you want to form a company, you, uh, as I said, complete the registration forms, you then file them at the registry called Companies House. And once those forms have been checked off by Companies House and everything's approved, then the company be, will be what's called incorporated. And the procedure for this is set out in Section 15 of the Companies Act. That's the 2006 Act. As soon as the company's incorporated, effectively it becomes a legal person, just like you and I. It receives a, an incorporation certificate, and that's like the birth certificate of an individual. The company then has a separate existence from those that own it and manage it. So the company, just like any human being, has legal rights, legal duties. 
Which brings us then to the case I referred to a little earlier of Salomon and Salomon. It's worth dwelling a little bit on this case because it is uh, really the foundation of UK company law. So what happened in Salomon and Salomon was that this character Aaron Salomon had been in business for some years as a leather merchant and boot manufacturer. So he'd been working um, as a sole trader and also uh, in partnership. So that's what we call an unincorporated business. So effectively what that meant was that Mr. Salomon uh, was liable entirely for all the debts of the, comp of the business. So the business was Mr. Salomon. He took the decision in 1892 to form a limited company to take over the business. So he registered a company at Company's House and then he transferred the business to the company. So the company had uh, a share capital of £40,000. The business itself was um, valued, some at the time said overvalued, at £39,000. So because the business was owned by Mr. Salomon personally, in order to take advantage of the company's structure, he had to sell the business to the company. So effectively, the company, the newly incorporated company, bought the business from Mr. Salomon. And the way that it paid for the business was that Mr. Salomon received £20,000 in £1 shares in the company. He also received um, a debenture, and a debenture is a, a effectively a loan agreement. So there was a, a, an agreement between him and the company to say that the company owed him £10,000. He also received the sum of £9,000 from the company. So as we said on the previous slide, the company, the, the business was valued at £39,000. So, Mr. Salomon received £39,000 from the company, £9,000 in cash, £20,000 in shares, and £10,000 by way of a debenture showing that the company owed him that, that £10,000 as a loan. So Mr. Salomon became the majority shareholder. At that time, under company's legislation, you couldn't have single person companies, therefore uh, other com other, there had to be other shareholders in the company, but Mr. Salomon owned by far the majority of the shares. He owned 20,001 shares of the 20,007 that the company had been incorporated with, and indeed the other shares were in fact owned by his family. So he effectively controlled the company. He could decide what the company did. He could pass resolutions. He also became the managing director of the company. So again, the legislation at the time required there to be more than one director, but uh, he was very much the, the, the dominant figure on the board. It was he, Mr. Salomon, who, as previously, decided the direction of the company, took all the trading decisions, all the business decisions relating to it. He was also the company's only secured creditor by way of the debenture that was granted to him when he sold the business to the company. Now at the time the company was uh, incorporated and the business transferred to it in 1892, uh, the business was, was extremely profitable. Mr. Salomon had a contract with the British Army to supply boots and he was making a good income from that. However, things went wrong. If things hadn't gone wrong, then this case would never have become the, uh, the foundation of UK corporate law that it is. But things did go wrong. He lost the uh, contract with the British government to supply boots to the army, and things went from bad to worse. The company started losing significant amounts of money, and ultimately it went into liquidation. So, effectively, it became insolvent. In 
the company had very limited assets with which to pay off its creditors. And in fact, it didn't have enough money, didn't have enough assets to pay both the secured creditor, i.e. Mr. Salomon, and the unsecured creditors. So the customers, and in particular the suppliers, who had been doing business with the company. So somebody was going to have to lose out. The question, as is always the case in insolvency, was who would lose out? Because if Mr. Salomon's debenture was valid and enforceable, then there would be no money left to pay the unsecured creditors. So the question was whether, the question that went to court was whether or not the company could be regarded as a separate legal entity from Mr. Salomon himself. So the argument that was raised by the, the liquidator on the company's insolvency was that actually Mr. Salomon and the company were effectively one and the same thing. The liquidator argued that he owned the overwhelming majority of the shares in the company and he was the managing director of the company and that he was running the company in just the same way as he had run the business prior to its incorporation in 1892. So as far as the liquidator's challenge was concerned, his argument to the courts was that actually this company was just a sham. It was set up in order to uh, try and protect Mr. Salomon from the consequences of the business going bust which is what actually happened. And so the liquidator argued before the courts that Mr. Salomon should be treated as the company and that Mr. Salomon therefore would not, should not be entitled to the benefits of the debenture and indeed he should be made personally liable for the debts of the company. This case went right through the, the uh, English courts um, in the Court of Appeal, the court agreed with the liquidator. They said, yes, this company is a sham. The company was simply uh, set up as an alias or an agent or a trustee for Mr. Salomon. Therefore, Mr. Salomon and the company should be treated as one and the same thing. And not only was the debenture issued to him invalid, because effectively he'd issued it to himself, but also Mr. Salomon was liable to indemnify the company for the trading debts. In other words, he was held by the Court of Appeal to be personally liable for the debts of the company. So what they were saying was that even though this company had been properly registered, the law had been complied with in full, it had been registered as a separate company from Mr. Salomon, but they said it was a sham, that actually Mr. Salomon should be treated as the same as the company and there should be no separate legal personality. And this was in many ways the, the commonly held view at the time because it was thought in the 1890s that actually the company structure should only be used for large trading operations, not for small businesses like that of Mr. Salomon. So the Court of Appeal really upheld the, uh, the status quo. Their decision was very much in line with uh, previous authority. However, the House of Lords disagreed, and this is why it's such a significant case. Because the House of Lords reached exactly the opposite decision. What they said was that in all situations where the law has been complied with, a company has been properly registered, properly incorporated, then that company will at law be an entirely distinct and separate person from those that form the company, those that own the company, those that manage the company. So in this situation they said that the company was at law a distinct and separate person from Mr. Salomon himself. Therefore, they said, the debenture was valid and could be enforced by Mr. Salomon. And he, of course, was not going to be personally liable for 
the debts of the company. There was one condition, there was one proviso, however, that the House of Lords set. And this was that the company would only be treated as a distinct and separate person if there was no evidence of any fraudulent intent on behalf of Mr. Salomon. And in this case, they found none. Uh, although they agreed that possibly the business had been slightly overvalued, there was no indication that this was anything other than a, a, a genuine mistake of valuation by Mr. Salomon. And there was no clear evidence to suggest that he had set up the company uh, merely to protect himself from the risk of personal liability on insolvency. In fact, in 1892, when the company was, was set up, uh, the business was very profitable. It was benefiting from the army contract. And so there was no reason to, to think that Mr. Salomon uh, believed that the company, that the business was about to go bust. So in the absence of any fraudulent intent, uh, the court said, the House of Lords said, that you must treat the company as a completely separate legal entity from Mr. Salomon. It was properly and duly formed, there was no evidence of fraudulent intent, and therefore the company should not, as the Court of Appeal held, be uh, treated as the mere agent or trustee of, the, uh, of Mr. Salomon, but it should be treated as an entirely separate legal entity. And Mr. Salomon was not the same as the company, and Mr. Salomon was not therefore liable for the company's debts. So Salomon and Salomon is a key decision in company law history because it's really been largely unchallenged ever since it was decided back in the 1890s. This decision remains the foundation stone of UK corporate law and indeed the basic, uh, the basic fact that a company is uh, a separate legal entity from those behind the company is, is common to company laws internationally as well. So this is not just an important principle in UK company law, it's an important principle in global company law. There are, however, some circumstances in which the uh, separateness of the company can be challenged. There are situations uh, where a company will not, in fact, be treated as a separate legal entity. The UK courts refer to this as uh, lifting the veil or peeping behind the veil. There are various different uh, words that the, the courts have come up with to describe this concept. But there are situations, um, not always entirely clearly defined, where separate legal personality can be ignored. And I'll be talking to you about that in the next presentation. Okay, thank you very much for listening.